Building 429 has championed their storied 15-year career with a slew of powerful battle cry overcomer anthems. But when it came time to churn out songs for the pop rocker's latest recording, they found themselves dipping their songwriting pens into a well of content that sounded less like a victory chant and more like a prayer of total surrender. On the heels of the new album called The Journey, the band's frontman and chief songwriter Jason Roy traces the footsteps of his own recent journey reconciling a childhood faith with an authentic day-to-day discipleship. Listen in on this candid episode of CCM Magazine's Features on Film. I'm your host, Andrew Greer. Okay, so Jason Roy, Building 429, right? I think of, when I think of your band and when I think of how y'all's music has really uh, taken hold in the Christian music marketplace, but just music in general, it's been these kind of uh, battle cry anthems, right? This overcoming, uh, this unwavering faith type of anthem, type of song. And on this record, you know, we're looking at different elements, I think, of humanity, also of God, because you're getting into a real struggle with real faith. And also like, I mean, I hear things, I hear you even talk about shame. I mean, that's a heavy word for what I would have associated with building 429 before. How did that kind of become the genesis of these songs? You know, was that a personal journey? Yeah, I mean, I I think that this this whole record was a a massive personal Mm -hmm. journey. Um, I. I've struggled with a lot of things throughout my life, and and I think that a lot of a lot of the way that I would handle my situation uh, would be always kind of just shove it down and mm-hmm. act like it doesn't exist and keep moving, you know. And, and I, I, I come from um, anybody that knows anything about me knows that I come from a military father who is a pro power lifter. I mean, he was Texas State's strongest <laughs> man. I mean, mm-hmm. you you don't complain a lot about right. a guy like that, you know. You just <laughs> yeah, kinda, you let it be. <laughs> yeah, and, and you learn very early um, that. You know, you, you just got to keep fighting. And then, but the, what's what's weird is that I ran into, uh, in these last five years, I kind of ran into myself a little bit and kind of hit the brick wall of, man, I'm, I'm totally not talking about the whole story here. Like, there's a lot more going on that I'm not letting anybody really know about in my life. And um, and the, the big thing that I've never wanted anybody to know about me is has been the struggle. Um, I never wanted anybody to believe that there were times when I really doubted and when I was really scared. I, that's, that, that right there is the thing that I'm the most scared of, to admit that I'm scared, right? That, Which that is I, pride, right? It's pride. It's totally, well, yeah, it is. And it's like a lack of confidence in who God is, which is all I've ever written about is I'm confident in who right, God yeah, is. Right, yeah, this thing. Which is, um, it's interesting because I feel like all those songs were kind of me saying, will yourself to the finish line. Just will yourself mm-hmm. To believe these things, and then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you can't will yourself, and you don't know why. You know, mm-hmm. I, I honestly kind of hit rock bottom and got to a place where I felt like I couldn't even get up and mm-hmm. uh, like even function. Yeah, you have this. I, I loved this one quote that I was reading. I'm a fighter, the kind of guy that's up for a battle and up to win. But lately, it's been difficult to get up. That's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Paint that picture for me. I mean, where did you find yourself, even if it was just? Was it a heart thing, a mental thing, you know, all together, just yeah. body and soul? You know, what did that look like? Well, I mean, if, for me more than anything, I think just dealing with my kids. Mm. Um, I think the person that I ran into is is that all the things that I thought I was doing right r- really weren't making a huge difference. I mean, mm. I, I always said that my dad did everything wrong, so I was going to go the opposite way and make sure I did everything right. Mm. And raising my kids and, and choosing over and over again to do the best that I possibly could to be godly and to be a good father and all that kind of stuff. Um, I thought I was going to help my kids avoid depression. I mm-hmm. thought I was going to help them avoid conflict. I thought I was going to help them avoid fear. And I thought I was going to put them in a place where they could just jump over that whole segment of sure. their life. Skip it. Skip it, yeah. And I guess the wall started kind of come, coming crumbling down around me when I realized that my son was dealing um, and my and my daughter were were dealing with those things. And I was like, Wait a minute! Like I did everything right, mm-hmm. and and um and then I had to take a good look in the mirror and go, wait, did I did I do everything right? Like to gloss over the reality that that there is suffering in this life, and that there are moments when we get sad and when we get and, and what I realized was that we are bad mourners. Like, we don't do that. That's not what the American dream's about. That's but that is an absolute biblical part <laughs> of our lives, and. 
and I kind of ran into a place where I realized I hadn't mourned that my father left my family. I hadn't mourned that my parents were divorced or that I had traveled around the country as a kid and could not really name but maybe one friend that I still had from high school and or the bad relationships that I had in the beginning of building 429 with with good people. Mm -hmm. You know, I just kind of started just realizing, man, I'm not who I wanted to be. And everything that I've been telling people that I am, I'm not either. And and that just kind of brought the walls down on me. And I had to figure out how to get how to how to get through that. And the mm -hmm. only way I knew how to get through that was Number one, to be be real, uh -huh. you know, be open. Say it out loud. Say it. Say it out loud. Call it what it is. And that's where this record started kind of coming together. Say it out loud. Call it what it is. Go to a writing session and just cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, well, there's that's a the worst thing in the world to <laughs> ever do. But yeah. But maybe not. I mean, the it takes you. You say we're not good at mourning. We're not good at grief. We're not good at giving things the space, you know, to let go of certain things so new things. Uh, grow from there, right? right? So, so in a way, I mean, I'd say culturally, as humans, we're kind of stunted. You know, we're not growing because we refuse to let some things go so that other things can be born. It sounds like you had to go through that morning process of letting. It sounds like letting yourself go to some degree, at least yeah. letting an idea of yourself go. Well, yeah, and um, transparently, I didn't start playing music to be um, not the best. <laughs> and to to be not, you know, the biggest, baddest, biggest selling artist of all time. That's mm -hmm. what I came here to do, man. And mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, one day I kind of woke up and realized that that was just so wrong. Like the priority, the way that I chose to, to live my life. And, you know, it's a season where I, I, in fact, on a record that we were nominated for a Grammy on, I wore this, uh, we figured out this thing, this branding we were going to do, and I wore this silver suit. And it was, it was really a personality that I became. Mm -hmm. And I had to, almost in the same way that I've heard you two say that they had to chop Joshua Tree down, mm. like I had to chop that guy down. I had to just take him, cut him out, and throw it away. And, and, and that's what I did. And as we were writing this record, there was a whole lot of new things that started coming up that were um, real. Shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm ashamed of who I've been. And, and I, I had to figure out how to write that song. And, and as I was writing that song, I began to realize the more that I called it out, the more that I shared with my, with my friends, the more mm -hmm. that I was honest with them, the more that I found that I wasn't alone. And no, yeah. because I had felt like I was an imposter in my own life for a long time. Mm. Which will produce, I think, shame. But I've also heard about shame. Like you talk about the song, shame doesn't live here, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I heard someone else say that guilt says you've done something wrong. Shame says you are something wrong. Yeah. So that's the toxicity. That's the problem with shame. Guilt can be a motivator. Okay, I did something wrong. I want to do something different. Right. But shame says, too bad, ground level, you're wrong. So yeah. is that, I mean. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely what's been worked out in my own life. Uh -huh. Because, because like when, when I look at, at, at who, I, I got to the point where I believed that I, I was a liar and, I was, and, and that I was like, everything I had done before was all fake. And someday somebody's going to figure that out mm. and you're, and you're going to be alone and nobody's going to love you. Nobody's going to care about you. Someday your voice is going to disappear mm -hmm. and everybody's, nobody's going to care. That's, that was the, the stuff that shame was piling on top uh -huh. of me. And, uh, and so, you know, even writing uh, songs like The Journey, um, those, those tunes were like this super awesome experience where I finally just kind of said what I meant and was super real about it. And, um, and it, it seems like it has really connected, especially when it connected, when it started connecting with my family first, mm -hmm. I felt like we were kind of onto something. And, um, and then a lot of the record is written to my son and to my daughter for the things that they can't hear their dad say. You know, like I, I really can't sit down and try to coach him anymore. I mean, he's 15, he's like, <laughs> you know. But I always thought maybe if I could write this into a song, yeah. all the things that I wish I would have known when I was his age. And that's where a lot of the songs from this record come from, too. Yeah, there's psalms about God singing over us. And I wonder mm. if there's something about singing, even if you think about it, I can't necessarily sit down and say all this to my son. Maybe he won't listen. Maybe I don't have all the perfect things to say, but being able to sing it to him. There's a translation in music. Right. Was music no that doubt. for you, too? Like a translation of maybe hearing actually who God says you are versus yeah. who you've been trying to be? Yeah, so the record came out that... that kind of radically altered my life. Um, the first Third Day record, there was a song called Love Song for a Savior. Mm -hmm. Savior. And 
And the local radio station where I was from, for some reason on Sunday morning, they played that song every Sunday morning. So, <laughs> I, so I'd wake up and I'd hear that song and it was love that, um, that I didn't feel like I'd experienced yet. And I didn't feel like I knew. And I just longed for it, you know, that's what I wanted. Um, and so it really inspired me and it really made me think, not only that, but on top of that, the fact that Mac had a similar voice that I had um, I mean, Max, a ridiculous singer, but we had a similar timbre, yeah. and it was. And I, you know, I had been in choir, and they kind of said, "You don't fit." <laughs> like, bless you, kid. <laughs> yeah, your voice does not blend. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when I heard um, that song, "Love Song for a Savior," I was like, "That's it. That's what." I, in fact, my first, the first um, demo that I ever made, that song was on it. You know, and 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 so uh, through the years. Um, I hope that our music in some small way has done the same thing for somebody else, but that's kind of where it started for me. Yeah. I uh, I think about that love, I mean, a craving. I, I feel like what you experienced when you first heard that song, thinking that's what I desire, that's what I want, you know, that you started getting some inkling of that. That was placed in us before we were ever, mm, that's our tether, no doubt. tether to God. No doubt. How has that shifted or how has that changed? Or do you feel like, do you feel more connected to God now or do you just feel connected to God in a different way? Like, has it been a perspective mm. changer or has it been a life changer? Yeah, I think uh, for me, I would say it has been a perspective change. Um, there, there have been different aspects of it that have mm -hmm. really changed a lot for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, but more than anything, I think it's just the vulnerability that that, that piece of my life didn't exist, yeah. right? And, and that caused me to have very shallow relationships with a lot of people. It also caused me to have some um, relationships even with people in Christian music that were mm -hmm. strained just because of the way I walked into the room. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And and I kind of, I've known that for a long time. I just didn't know how to fix it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm just me. Why, why you do I... You sensed it, but you didn't know what the yeah, problem was like, maybe? What yeah. was the root of that? Yeah, like what what is it about me that's uh, huh. that's offensive? And <laughs> as some people would say, you just, you just take over a room. And, and I, I didn't even know what that meant. And what I began to realize is that um, what they were saying is that there was no vulnerability at all. There was no, um, it's just a, a confidence and walk with, it's the same way that my father used to, I mean, my dad used to walk up to a 600 pound bar, a 650 pound bar and pull it off the ground for a rep. And the only way to pull that bar off the ground was not vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It was right. absolute confidence and assurance that you're going to do it. Uh -huh. um, and so that was just what was wired into me. Like, I, that's how I have to approach this. And I just began to realize I had a lot of broken relationships and a lot of people that had mistaken what they thought that I really was. Because deep down inside, I actually genuinely care and want deep relationships. I just didn't know how to get them. Mm -hmm. and, and so that vulnerability piece has kind of jumped into my life and it has helped me so much as a father with my kids to kind of be able to say, hey, it's okay. Uh, you know, I, we don't have to solve this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Uh -huh. and, and to just love people that that has changed a lot for me to, to not uh to not be in such a hurry to get to a goal but to say hey mm -hmm. along this go this this journey <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm going to choose to live these moments and love people as i go and and be vulnerable with them when i can be one way i think to love people well which you're expressing is to shoulder up with them wherever they are on their journey right and i think being able to share your pathway through doubt and maybe the doubts you still have. Like it, it seems somewhere that if you grew up in the church, like I know you did and I did, that somewhere doubt, for someone who believes in God or is a disciple of Jesus, doubt was seen as a weakness of faith. Do you do you think that doubt is really just a lack of faith or is it something? No, oh, I don't, I disagree. I, I think that doubt is a part of faith and I feel like it's something that we walk through and that, uh, that's my personal opinion uh, because I felt it, and I, and I think that, you know, when we're supposed to be working out mm -hmm. our faith, I feel like a large part of that is, is continued, because I think that what doubt causes us to do is it causes us to, to dig, mm. right? Okay. And, uh, and for me personally, I just feel like, um, you know, when, when I hit moments of doubt, yes, it's hard and it's an emotional toll, but now more than ever, I see those moments as doubt, uh, of doubt as moments where I kind of draw near and, and I mm. dig for, for, like, God, okay, God, I'm here, like, where are you? What's going on? And, um, and it's been, I've kind of finally accepted that because again, the old Jason had no doubts mm -hmm. and was frustrated and angry and always a mess, <laughs> but nobody knew it. 
Yeah, right. right I was falling right, apart, right, but nobody right, knew right. it. You were like everybody else, but you weren't going to. Right. I wasn't going to show that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Man. Yeah, yeah. I The song that you guys sang, Same God, give me the whole title of that yeah, one. Yeah, it's called The Same God. The yeah. Same God, yes. I love the sentiment of that, and I think it's more than a sentiment. I think it's been your experience. But you go, you know, you start the song talking about walking the aisle, and I think about the country church that I grew up in, mm -hmm. and all the, like the core message was there. Mm. You know, there were a lot of other things going on. We were talking about this right, right beforehand, right? Sometimes people aligned our faith with politics or right, Christianity sure. with politics, yeah. or sometimes there were some legalistic uh, motives that said this is right and this is wrong that had nothing to do with the relationship with God with, or with Scripture. But it seems what you've come back to or through this journey and through the journey that you've come back to that truly the God that was introduced to you as a child, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is God the same or how is he different? Or what have you discovered yeah, and uncovered my, about God? Yeah, so yeah. The, the thing that I've really kind of come to know about God is that my perspective on him has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. But the, the fundamental truths that I grew up on are, are, I believe, absolutely concrete for me. And I'm so thankful for those fundamental truths because they have been the rock, the bedrock of my life when everything kind of fell apart. You know, when I was rebuilding my life, uh, if you will, kind of mm -hmm. after my fallout, I just kind of went back to the word and was like, okay, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> help. And it was amazing to me because it, it's all these different scriptures that I'd heard quoted over me. Like some, but all of a sudden they meant something and they really were deep and meaningful to me and they, they mattered. And, and um, you know, and I look back at, at um, again, the, to me, there, there are beautiful parts of the Baptist church that I grew up in. And I think one of the things that I couldn't figure out is I, I, I desperately wanted people to not fail, right? And so I had this big problem with the church because of the failures of people, not the failures of the church, sure. right? And, um, and I think that kind of walking, walking that out, um, I began to realize that these were just good and godly people doing the best they could, and they were mistake making mistakes. And yes, those mistakes hurt, and they are frustrating, but they, they love Jesus. And, and, and it's funny, I look back at my church now, and I see that the amazing things that that even the Baptist church continues to do from a mission standpoint mm -hmm. around the world. It's right. insane, the mm -hmm. things that they do. And like you said, there are always things that, that, that made me kind of want to go, I forget that church, man. I got nothing to do with it. I mean, when I started playing music when I was 19, you didn't take an electric guitar into church without getting kicked out. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, yeah. so I had a lot of preconceived notions and frustrations as it related to the church. But as I was rebuilding my life, there were so many pieces and parts of it that just kind of wrecked me. It's like fundamental truths that I was so thankful that um, that I had that growing up, and that these people just shot straight with me, and and, um, and there are, there are think parts and pieces of it that frustrate me still to this day. But ultimately, <laughs> sure. I'm and thankful will. that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I can trust that He's unchanging and He doesn't make mistakes. Um, and I say it like this: I say that every man-made monu monument will fall. I saw that with my father. He built this massive physique and this massive man, and it fell apart. Uh, and in the same way, I just, I'm, I'm hoping that today I'm about um, building the kingdom of God and not building my own, you know, monument because this monument will fall just as it did. You know what I mean? And so I think that's one of the, the big things, perspective shifts have been for me. It's not the church's fault that, um, that sometimes people get hurt. Uh, it's just people that make, make honest mistakes, kind of like I do. Yeah, yeah. If you had to, this, if you, if you could look outside of yourself, and you see that guy in the silver suit, Grammy nominated, playing this part, and you see yourself today. Mm. Uh, who is Jason Roy, do you feel like, today? <laughs> I mean, I think that today I'm just, I'm just, I've been humbled, you know? And I, I used to feel like I had to have every answer. And uh, today I'm, I'm probably, I'll tell you this. One major difference between the guy who was Grammy nominated and standing on the biggest stages and riding elevator lifts over 30 feet over people's heads with pyro going off and the guy who's sitting here today is I don't have any of those things and I'm way more thankful. And I'm way more grateful for what the Lord has done and how much he's given and for the opportunities that I have to love people. Um, that guy, I think, uh, was trying to take over the world, you know? Hmm. And like I said, those monuments always fall. I was five, I walked the aisle singing just as I am. 
while my granddaddy held my hand He said you were a big god so I so I laid my life down I grew up in that old church listening to the sound the voices of worship ringing out They said you were a big god but I Wondered how you fit in that small town And then at 17 I just had to leave To find out who you are to me I needed to climb a mountain and find you there Hear your voice in the ocean And sing hallelujah in a language I never know the storm and know your peace sing hallelujah over the years I have grown and after all I have seen you're still the same God to me at the age of 22 I walk the aisle again and there I took her in Said you were a big God, and so our little family began. I couldn't ask for more than what you gave me, Lord. What was I still searching for? I needed to climb a mountain and find you there. Hear your voice in the ocean. Still the same God to me.